In this video, you will learn how to make the perfect sourdough bread at home. It has nice oven spring, it features a crisp crust, it's soft on the inside, it's the perfect bread. First of all, I'll be talking about the tools and don't worry, we will be using only the minimum tools you need. My goal here is really to make a recipe that enables everyone, even with a small pocket, to bake amazing bread at home. Next up, we'll be talking about the process. I'll provide you with a full flow chart from start to finish so you know exactly what you have to do step by step. Afterwards, I'll be explaining you the recipe, including all the ingredients that you need. Need. We'll be doing a deep dive on the perfect flour for your sourdough bread as well. Afterwards, we will be talking about kneading, also known as creating dough strength. And this recipe is really for lazy people. You don't have to knead a lot. And of course, a stand mixer could be used. Then afterwards, the main fermentation starts, also known as the bulk fermentation. This can be tricky. Some people ferment for too long, some for too short, but I have the perfect trick that enables you to master this step. Afterwards, we have a big blob of dough. We still need to put that one into the right shape. And that's what we're doing then the shaping stage. I'll show you how to shape the perfect dough. Then we will be talking about the second fermentation, also known as proofing. Once that is finished, we will be baking our dough and I will be providing you with several options, including an option where you don't even need an oven. And number nine, we made our first bread. I'll show you how to prepare for the next dough and keep shipping sourdough daily. So these are the tools you need. Ideally, a large metal pot with a lid. That's where our dough will go inside. A relatively large bowl in which you put a kitchen towel or a banneton. If you don't have the linen, you could also just totally put a kitchen towel inside. A small shot glass or a glass like this, ideally cylindric shape like this one. Two trays. Ideally a sharp razor blade. If you feel it's a bit unsafe to operate the razor blade, you can also get an attachment to your razor blade like this one. If you're just getting started, a scale is super helpful too. An oven is useful, but you could also bake everything inside of a pan. Preferably, you also have a fridge. Now, if you don't, don't worry. Oh, I definitely need to clean this up. Now, you will need a sourdough starter for this recipe. If you don't have one, no worries. I'll be linking my recipe right here. And this is the full process from start to finish. You ready your sourdough starter around 8 to 12 hours before you want to mix your dough. I typically like to do this in the evening. Then the next morning, I mix everything together and I start kneading. This creates dough strength. Afterwards, whenever I see that my dough flattened out quite a lot, that's when I apply a stretch and fold. This is typically once every two or three hours. Once the dough doubled in size, we will proceed with shaping our dough. Then it's up to you. Either you can bake the dough directly after a short period of room temperature, or you can go to bed and place your dough in the fridge overnight for up to 24 hours. And lastly, you will bake the dough to make yourself the perfect sourdough bread. So for a sourdough bread, you just have flour, water, salt and your stutter as ingredients. Nothing else should be put into a sourdough bread. Bakers always like to use a formula called Baker's Math. Baker's Math is a really easy way for you to scale up every recipe. That's why I showed you here the same recipe for two breads. You could also be making three or four, as many as you like at the same time. All you do is you increase the quantity of flour and then recalculate the percentages. Seriously, it makes things so much easier if you want to scale up or scale down something. Now, let's quickly talk about how much water you should be using and then about how much sourdough starter you should be using. Because that's a very important piece of knowledge that you need in order to succeed with making bread at home. Now, flour is probably the single most important ingredient that you have in your sourdough though. And there are two categories of flour. You have the flour that contains gluten, wheat, spelt for instance, and the one that doesn't have as much gluten, rye, emmer, or the mother of all grains, einkorn. For the style of bread that we are baking in this video, we will be using category one. So you could also be making this with spelt, but I'll be using wheat flour. Making a bread out of category two, it's not as fluffy, but it's definitely way easier. You don't have to knead as much, you just homogenize all the ingredients. So if you're a lazy person, which I am, this is actually one of my favorite bread here, making everything just with plain rye. So simple. I'll be sharing a link in the description of the video. Now there are different wheat flour types. In the US, you typically have bread flour, all-purpose flour, and cake flour. They're all flours which are relatively white, so large parts of the hull have been removed. In Italy, that would be type 0 or type 00. There is a big difference though to bread flour. In Germany, it's the same. We have type 405 or type 550. That's what you want to be using for this recipe. But the same difference is there. The difference to bread flour is that bread flour contains more gluten. 
Check the packaging of your flour. Try to pick a flour which has a high protein content. It makes baking with sourdough a lot easier. If you're a chaser of a whole wheat sourdough bread, you can totally also get yourself a high gluten whole wheat flour. That's because I will be showing you a technique today that allows you to bake with every flour no matter how strong it is. That's one of the things that I wanted to recycle from my previous masterclass to this masterclass. Before I assumed you would always need to have very good flour, but now with this method you'll no longer need to. It's a much more accessible, much easier method. So how much water should you be using for your flour? This depends on the flour that you have at hand. Mostly the gluten in your flour is binding the water. Also, if you have a whole wheat flour, then the bran also binds a lot of water. For a low gluten flour, I recommend something around 60% of water based on the flour. So let's say you're using one kilogram of flour, you would be using around 600 grams of water. For a medium, so you have a bit more gluten, that would be something in the range of 10 to 12%, you can go to 70% water. If you have a high gluten flour, you can go to 80% or even a bit higher. Very important, this is what I miss when I was starting baking. I would just blindly follow water suggestions and my bread dough simply never came together. But I'll show you the moment we are kneading everything together what to look out for. By understanding this piece of knowledge, you have already solved a great riddle when making sourdough bread. I wish I knew this directly at the start. So how much starter should you be using to make a sourdough dough? The amount of starter that you should be using for your dough depends on the temperature that you have. Generally in summer I use less starter and in winter I use more starter. So for one dough, that's around 10% of stutter in summer and in winter 20%. And that's because based on how much stutter we are using, we can control how long making the dough is going to take. Some recipes call for a process called autolysis, where you just mix flour and water. But you get the same benefits of this technique by just letting your dough ferment for a bit longer. A ferment to lease, that's what we're doing. It's much simpler because you don't need to mix your dough two times. Now, if it's very hot where you're living, then you might want to use even less starter. I'm always aiming for a main fermentation time of 8 to 12 hours. And with the starter, with the amount of starter, I can control this. Also, if your starter is very ripe, you can use a bit less starter. If your starter is not that ripe, you can use more starter. But a good rule of thumb is 20% in winter and 10% in summer. So in this video, we are using a stiff sourdough starter. And a stiff sourdough starter is definitely a game changer for you. That's because you always have yeast and bacteria in your stutter. Now, depending on how much water you have in your stutter, you either boost the yeast or you boost the bacteria. The yeast is mostly creating CO2 and ethanol and the bacteria is creating the acidity. Now, the bacteria is also consuming the ethanol created by the yeast. It's a very interesting symbiosis between all the microorganisms. The most common acids that are produced are lactic acid and acetic acid. They're very important for the flavor of your final bread as well. Now, what the bacteria also does is the bacteria eats the gluten of your flour. And that means that over time you will have less and less gluten. Now gluten is also what holds the dough together. And this means over time, your dough is going to lose more and more structure. The gluten network becomes softer, which also means the dough can increase more in size. Now, most of the stutters are always equal parts of flour and water. That's 100% hydration. But with stiff stutter, we have around a stutter of 40 to 50% hydration. And what happens is you have a lot more yeast activity. In fact, you can use this stutter for every recipe out there and you can just replace the yeast with a stiff starter. So after watching this video, you can say goodbye to store-bought yeast. Now the stiff starter is really great news because you will have more yeast activity and not so much bacteria that also eats your gluten network. And this on the other hand means that you can use a flour that's not so high in protein content. It doesn't need so much gluten. And this definitely makes this recipe much more accessible. Even if you're living in a place where you can't afford high quality expensive flour, no worries. With a stiff stutter, you can make the most amazing sourdough bread. And this has been such an eye-opening change compared to my previous recipe. Now to make a stiff sourdough stutter, all you need to do is you need to use your regular stutter and then give it a couple of feedings with a different hydration. For the flour that you're using, use half the amount of water. Repeat that over a few days and you will have an amazing stiff sourdough stutter. So this is definitely gonna be a game changer for you. Are you excited? Because today you are going to be learning how to make an amazing sourdough bread. All the ingredients have been added and now we are just going to use our hand to stir everything together. Now you could totally be kneading this in a stand mixer too, but I think if you're just getting started, try making this by hand because it's an eye-opening experience 
you will understand much better how the dough should feel like. So I challenge you, try to make your first 10 doughs by hand completely. One of the annoying things about the sieve stutter is definitely the mixing part. But it just requires a bit more effort in exchange for having an even more awesome sourdough bread in the end. Note that I'm not really trying to knead, I'm just trying to homogenize everything so that all the ingredients are spread across the dough evenly. Okay, maybe it's just because I'm German. I would never <laughs> let any dough go to waste. <laughs> so this has been mixing for around two minutes by hand. I don't see large chunks of stutter anymore. This is looking great. And now, because I'm a lazy person, we will be waiting for 10 minutes and that's going to make all the difference. The dough is going to come together just by waiting. We could knead like a crazy person now, but just by waiting 10 minutes, we get free dough strength, free kneading. Just to show you, check how this dough is now. This is a sign that you should look for. It tears directly, right? But in 10 minutes, we will be back and this is gonna be a complete difference. Hello again, gluten tag my dough. With slightly wetted hands, I am checking the dough now and see this exactly what I promised you. You develop this amazing gluten network simply by waiting. This is how the dough should look like for you now. If it does not, try adding a bit more flour to the mix, homogenize again and wait another 10 minutes. This is exactly the consistency that you want to have before proceeding. Now I'm proceeding to knead by hand. All I'm going to do is I'm going to take the dough and I'm folding it upwards. I'm not doing a slap and fold something crazy. I don't want to create a mess in my kitchen. Just like this for around a minute. And see, I can already lift the dough with my hand. It's not sticking to the bowl anymore. And also note how the dough is resisting when I'm trying to pull it. This is a sign that you have a very elastic dough now and that your gluten network has developed. If you simply can't get this consistency, then you might have the wrong flour. I would suggest to proceed with using a loaf pan for your dough. Just place your dough inside, wait until it has increased a bit in size, and then bake it in your oven. Our dough is already looking quite good. I'm gonna give it another 10 minutes of rest and then we'll be back. So now I will be extracting a tiny piece of the dough. If you have a bench scraper, sorry, a dough scraper, that's totally what you can use. I will be taking this dough and I will be placing this in this tube. And this tube here, which could also be a shot glass, you have to be a bit careful with this, or another jar, whatever you have, is the trick that will elevate your sourdough game. I like to have a tiny thermometer like this, so it's around 21 degrees Celsius. And right now it's very late, almost dinner time in Germany, <laughs> 11 a.m. And I want this dough to grow here, which I think is gonna happen probably at 9 uh, p.m. Oh, I'm so bad at writing. <laughs> now again, this depends on so many factors, like your temperature, how active your sourdough starter is and everything. I'm always aiming for around a fermentation period of eight to 12 hours. So this has to sit directly next to my dough. If the temperature in your kitchen changes a lot during the day, this might not work so well because this heats up faster and cools down faster than your main dough. So keep them close together and you will always be making the perfect sourdough because you have now created a master fermentation probe. Bowl cleaned, now let's transfer our dough back to the bowl. I am going to be wetting my hands a little bit. That makes things so much easier. We need to round up the dough because right now it's a mess. I touch it and it sticks to my hands. This is nothing I want. If we make a nice round smooth surface, the dough is going to be way stickier already. This is a common mistake I see many people doing. So at around 45 degree angle, I'm pushing into the dough 
and then I'm pulling it over the surface. Note how the center part here is not moving. You have to be a little bit faster so the dough won't stick. If you have a dough scraper, you will not lose any of your dough over the surface. But I wanted to show you that you can also do it without tools because nobody should be required to buy tools to make amazing bread. That's exactly the kind of dough that you want to have. See, now I'm touching the dough and it's not sticky at all. Try this. This is how your dough should be at this stage. Now I can just take the dough, I wet my hands again a bit, I take it and I gently move it to the other container where it's going to sit. We will close the lid so that it doesn't dry out. So around two hours pass and I see that the dough flattened out quite a lot. This is always when I like to give the dough a stretch and fold. This gives the dough some additional dough strength, which means it will hold better together in the oven and you will have more oven spring. With wetted hands, I'm just releasing the dough a little bit from the bowl. And then I just go into the dough. I lift it upwards and I fold it over. See, not sticking to my hands. It starts to stick, just use a bit more water. One more time from the other side and now from the other sides as well. Good looking dough. See you again soon. Good evening. Our sample has reached the desired size increase and it seems like I'm actually getting a bit of a cold. The dough looks really nice. Please check out those pockets of air. This is exactly what you want to have. These are the signs that your fermentation is really perfect. Now we need to proceed and shape the dough. And for this, I'm just going to be sprinkling some flour on our dough. I'm going to be using a banneton like this, but you could also just use a bowl with a kitchen towel inside. That would totally work too. For bannetons, I like to use some which already have a linen inside. That makes things a lot easier. So let's flip over the container and hopefully the dough comes right out. We will be putting just a little bit more flour everywhere below the edges of the dough. Now this side here is very sticky and for shaping we are gluing the dough together. I will take the one side and fold it into the middle. I'm gently removing some of the excess flour. Now we repeat the same thing from the other side gluing our dough together. Note how the dough already holds its shape. With flour tans, I'm going to the top of the dough now and we will start to roll it in. I put my thumbs here and I start to roll the dough over. Perfect, that's our shaped dough. The rest of the excess flour I'm using to give the dough a good rub here. This way the dough won't stick to the Benetton or your kitchen towel. Now I gently lift the dough and put it into the Benetton. I sprinkle some of the rest of the flour here on top. And that's it, we shaped our dough. Now the technique I showed you, it's great for making one single dough. If you wanted to make a larger bulk dough, then you would need to, before shaping, divide the dough into smaller pieces and then give your dough a bit of a pre-shape, wait 15 minutes and then proceed with the shaping. But I think this technique I showed you today is very good. It's gentle on the dough and it's perfect for everything you do at home. Of course, there are other techniques which are a bit more efficient, but they might also be more challenging. I'll cover this with a kitchen towel now and then this dough goes into the fridge overnight. This sample I will now be feeding again. This is going to be my next sourdough starter for tomorrow morning. If you don't want to use it now, you could also fry this in a pan with a bit of oil or you could store this in your discard starter jar in the fridge. Now for proofing, you have several options. Do you want to bake in the next one to four hours? In my case, it has been quite late already. That's why that's no option for me. I'm going to place the dough in the fridge. In the fridge, your dough is going to be good for around eight to 24 hours. So then the next day, all you do then is you take your dough out of the fridge and you directly bake it. You don't let it come to room temperature first. Directly out of the fridge, it's going to be baked. If you want to bake the dough the same day, we will be waiting 30 minutes and then we will poke the dough. Is the dent still visible one minute later? If it is, we will be placing our dough in the freezer for 30 minutes and we will start preheating our oven. 
If not, we will wait another 30 minutes and repeat the same thing. This is called the finger poke test. The freezing helps to make the following scoring quite a lot easier. And then we will be baking the dough. Are you excited already? Because now you are about to bake your sourdough bread and I will be showing you three different options that you can choose from. You can make a regular bread, which is what we are making in this video, or you could also be making some bread rolls now out of your dough. Because bread rolls are the same as a bread, just in a different shape. And to do bread rolls, it's so simple. All you do is you take a knife or you take a dough scraper and you chop your dough into smaller pieces. And then you just bake them in the oven just the same way we are making the main bread. Very delicious. We like to eat this in Germany on Sunday, for instance. And Brötchen is a very hard German word. Try it. Please try it. Brötchen. Actually, it's not just named Brötchen. There are so many different words for Brötchen all across Germany. The last option, a non bread or a tortilla. You could be doing exactly the same now. All you do is you cut your Brötchen and then afterwards you push that down just a little bit. It's not going to be perfectly round, but still it will be delicious. This way you can bake bread without an oven. Just throw that into a pan and you will have amazing flatbread. Perfect also when you want to do a barbecue, for instance. So these are the options, but we will be focusing on this method in this video for now. Steam is the single most important ingredient to make amazing bread in your home oven. Now the method that I'm showing you here, it's a very simple method that almost everybody can do if you have an oven. All you need is two trays to make the perfect bread pretty much. So you have one tray here at the bottom. This tray will be preheated and you have another tray here at the top. Here, ideally you have a bowl. It should be something that can withstand temperature changes, maybe something out of steel or a cast iron. You will be pouring boiling water in here just before the bake. So this is preheated, this is also preheated. Once we are placing our dough inside of the oven, we will be adding this tray here on top. And this sort of simulates the Dutch oven. The water starts to evaporate and it's going to circle in here. This keeps the environment nice and moist. No crust is going to form directly, which means our dough still has room to expand in the oven. This is very, very crucial. So the first stage of the baking process, the first 30 minutes, are just to allow your dough to rise and reach the core temperature that you want. Now, once the core temperature reaches 92 degrees Celsius, you can measure that with a thermometer. In my case, that's always after around 30 minutes, you will be removing the source of steam from the oven. And then afterwards, for the last stage of the bake, that can be 10 minutes, can be 20 minutes, can be 30 minutes, depending on how thick and dark you like the crust. Actually, some people don't even do the second stage because they just want to have a super soft bread. Now, what you could also, of course, do is you could get yourself just a large metal pot and place this on top if you don't have the trays. Uh, I actually tried this before with an Ikea glass bowl. You have to be very careful though, it might shatter. You could be using pretty much everything to create this steamy environment. The idea is always the same. If you have a Dutch oven or if you have just a steel pot on top, the water from the dough is going to evaporate and it's going to circle inside all the time, keeping the surface nice and moist. Now, if you're the kind of person that only has an oven with a fan where you can't turn off the fan, then this option with a steel pot or a cast iron is going to be the best option for you. In case you can turn off the fan, then this method that I'm showing you here is going to perfectly work. Last note, don't go too hot in your oven. If you go too hot, you form a crust too quickly, preventing your dough from rising. The ideal temperature in my case has been around 230, sorry for my German, 230 degrees Celsius. This tray here is not preheated. I will just add it later on and it pretty much works like this. Steam goes up, like I showed you, will be trapped below. Perfect conditions. Now, if you have a pizza stone, then you can also just place a pizza stone here rather than this tray. With the pizza stone, you should be getting a little bit more oven spring. Your bread is gonna rise more in the oven because the stone transfers the heat faster to the dough. More water starts to evaporate right away. But this is definitely not required. You can also totally just bake on a tray. With the stone or with a Dutch oven, your bread might be better one or two percent. Gluten morgen. Our dough has been sitting in the fridge and it's ready to be baked. Now I'm going to be baking on my stone, but you could also totally be just baking on a tray like this. My stone is currently being preheated in the oven. Now I'll be using some parchment paper, but if you don't like that, you could also just be sprinkling some semolina flour here on top. But parchment paper just makes it a little bit easier. I'll flip over the dough carefully like this. Dough comes nicely out. Good sign that everything is right. If it's stuck, chances are 
that you have fermented for too long. Now we need to give our dough a tiny incision. We will be using a razor blade. You can get a handle like this, but a razor blade like this also totally works. Let me show you exactly how to score. It's not that easy. I'll explain everything you need to know on my whiteboard. This is something that I commonly got wrong when beginning baking sourdough bread. So this is our dough and we want to give it a tiny incision at around a 45 degree angle. We don't want to do the incision here in the center, a tiny bit off to the right, around one to two centimeters off. Now the 45 degree angle of course changes depending on where you score the dough. So here at this place, you have to hold your blade at almost a horizontal angle. By doing this, you are going to get that beautiful oven spring and a nice ear that adds this extra layer of crispness to your sardo bread. Sardo bread. All right, so let's score our dough then. Almost as flat as I can. I'll place my hand here on the dough. Then I'll try to, with one quick movement, go through the dough. That's it. Now, here I didn't properly cut yet, so I'm just gonna be fixing that. This just takes a few attempts to get right. This is called functional scoring. Now I'll be adding a small pattern here. This is decorative scoring. I like to give the dough a little bit of a spritz with water. It's also optional. I just think if your oven is quite hot, it helps with giving a little bit more steam to your dough, which is perfect because you don't want the crust to form. You want your dough to really nicely expand. All right, let's load our dough in the oven now. This is where the parchment paper really shines, makes it so easy to transfer the dough. Now this tray into the oven and then our dough. The water. Now after around 30 minutes, I will be removing the top tray here and also the rocks here with the water. And ta-da! The final bread. It's looking really nice. Beautiful ear here. Some blisters. This pattern looks very nice. From the bottom, we have a bit of a crust. I think this is a really great bread. Personally, some improvement areas, probably during shaping, what you can do is you can tuck together the dough a little bit so it won't look like this on the edge. Same here. From the bottom, if you use a Dutch oven made out of iron, the crust would be a little bit thicker here. Or I could have removed the stone and just baked it on a rack. But overall, I didn't want to complicate things too much. There's always room for improvement. But now let's slice this open and see the crumb structure. This sounds a little bit like a psychopath. Let's slice this open and see the crumb structure. <laughs> One more note, I baked this for another 20 minutes. So total time in the oven has been around 50 minutes. 15, not 15, 50. And depending on how long you bake in the end, you can control how dark you like the bread. I like this color. Every different color provides additional flavor. But if you don't like it too dark, you can definitely bake it way less. This depends on your personal preference. Mm, beautiful. To me, this is the perfect crumb structure. It's open, it's airy. It's not too open. I can put my jam on top of it. We have this nice bunny shape here. This looks really great. Now let's give this a shot if this actually also tastes great. So you can take a slice like this, but sometimes if I know I'm gonna inhale the bread, I also just like to take a slice like this. Mm, this looks so good. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Wow, it's crisp, it's soft, it has the slight acidity, this tang, it's mild, it's not too strong. This definitely is the perfect sourdough bread. I'm gonna finish all of this now. <laughs> so now you just made your first bread, but chances are it might not have exactly worked out the way you want it. Here are a couple of different crumb structures I wanted to show you so that you can debug what might have gone wrong on your bread. If your bread went perfect, congratulations. Well done. So 
This to me is the perfect crumb. You have different pockets of air spread all across evenly throughout the bread and your bread has nicely risen in the oven. Now, under fermented or under proofed, I prefer to use the term under fermented is when you have very, very large, gigantic pockets of air inside of your dough. It's almost like a flatbread that you made without any yeast. The water evaporated, creating super pockets. You have to either make your sourdough starter a little bit more active or you have to ferment for a longer period of time. If you have several pockets of air here, very close to the crust, larger ones, very likely you have baked at a too hot temperature. The crust formed too quickly, your dough couldn't expand. That's how the pockets are being created. And lastly, if your dough is relatively flat, but you have pockets everywhere, tiny pockets, it's a sign that you might have fermented for a bit too long. Still, this bread is probably going to be super, super, super delicious. It might not look as beautiful, but still, the longer you ferment, the more flavor you are also creating. By the way, did you know that you can also head to my Breadcode merch store and buy some awesome t-shirts like this? The Breadcode University shirt, one of my favorites. Also, thank you to all the monthly supporters. You make this channel possible. 